Yes, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think, yeah. Not, not you. Jonathan, not you, the classroom. Can, can you hear me? Uh, I think they do. See. Oh, they do? Yeah. Okay. So, Hello. Yes. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> okay, my name is Mahir. Uh, so, um, I barely hear you, but um, uh, how are you doing today? Good. Good. Okay, very nice. Okay. So, um, okay, so uh, today um, I would like to talk about some uh, basic algebraic geometry uh, and some algebraic group theory. Uh, do you have any familiarity with this subject? Hello, can you come again, please? Oh, now, now I hear you better. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, so uh, I was saying, uh, uh, do you, do you have any familiarity with this subject? Do you know uh, some basics? So uh, I'm wondering how in detail I how fast I should go. So I just wanted to know first. Okay. Well, I mean, let's assume that uh, they, I mean, it's, uh, they, they don't know the basics, so you can start with the basics and, and move up from there. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, um, okay. So let's, let's look at the uh, file. I'm sorry, this uh, page does not look super clear, the first page, uh, but uh, I'll try to go explanatory as possible. So hopefully it will make sense as I say it. Okay, so uh, our basic setup is as follows. Uh, we have a um, vector space, V. Uh, here I denote it by V, this, this one. Um, it's a vector space over um, an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. So, it's a vector space over complex numbers uh, for simplicity. And it's finite dimensional. So let's assume it, it is um, it is n-dimensional. In other words, it has a basis, E1, E2, and up to En. Uh, so it's n-dimensional. I'm, I'm denoting this, uh, choosing a basis, E1 up to En. Okay. Now, I would like to talk about this uh, basic object, the ring of polynomial functions on this vector space. So we all of us know what a function is, okay? Uh, and in linear algebra, we care about linear functions. So on this vector space, we will get all vector space homomorphisms from V with the underlying field K. So again, I'm assuming this underlying field uh, to be a field of complex numbers. If you, if you don't feel comfortable with arbitrary field, just think about complex numbers. Here, k, k is the complex numbers. Okay, so I'm looking at set of all uh, linear homomorphisms from V to K. V is the n-dimensional vector space, K is the underlying field. So, uh, of course, um, uh, these are linear functionals. So, um, because we started with a basis E1 up to En, we have the associated U um, basis for HOM K, right? For this space, HOM VK. So, this is a vector space too. And because V is finite dimensional, this vector space is also N dimensional, which is equal to dimension of V. And we have this uh, dual basis to E's. I'm going to denote them by X1 up to Xn. So E1 up to En is the basis for V. X1 up to Xn is the basis for the dual space. So Xi, or any i, is a linear functional from V to K. 
it does the following, right? X i maps e j to one. If indices i and j are the same, zero otherwise. So this is just basic linear algebra. We know this. Okay. Now, um, so maybe this part is slightly confusing. So what I do is I have this n linear functionals on the vector space v. And I take any polynomial expression, you know, a polynomial is anything like you multiply them and then add them up and multiply by some constant, add them up again. So a bunch of monomials, right? Some of monomials in these variables. But now my variables are linear functionals. Okay. So P is a polynomial in N variable. My variables are these linear functions, X1 up to Xn. Because xi's are functions themselves, when I substitute them into this polynomial p, I get a function again. So p of x1 up to xn is a polynomial function whose variables are functions, linear functionals. OK. Uh, well, these are the functions that we are interested in our vector space V. So we are looking at all uh, functions which are obtained from linear functionals by composing by polynomials in N variables. Okay, so I'm going to denote the set of all polynomial functions on V by K bracket V. This symbol here, uh, this one, let me, so this symbol, let me write it, K. So this is my underlying field. And V is the vector space. So this is the set of, um, this is the set of all polynomial functions on the vector space V. Okay. So this is my vector space. And this set of all polynomial functions on V forms a ring, right? So let me move to the next page. Okay, now, so we, on one hand, we have the, um, we have the vector space V. On the other hand, uh, we have the ring of uh, polynomial functions on our vector space. Uh, so when I, um, so now I would like to introduce uh, certain subsets of this vector space V. I, I'm going to define a topology on this vector space, right? Uh, for the moment, let's forget that actually this is a vector space, but rather it's just a space. So V is just a space. I'm going to define a subset of V, so uh, a, a subset of V is called Zariski clause, so a subset of V is called Zariski clause subset if there exists um, a set of polynomial functions on this vector space V such that uh, the set of all points in V that there are zero under this set of polynomials uh, is equal to my original set A. So let me try to write this down. So, so just take a subset A. I'm going to call this set is a risky clause if, so I'm introducing the topology. Right, so this is closed. If, if, uh, there exists uh, a subset, there exists a set of, uh, just a second, just let me delete this. Um, I just wanted to delete this symbol. 
Jonathan? Yeah. Um, to do that, I just uh, click on the undo in the in the on the whiteboard. There's a, and the undo. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, a subset is uh, closed. If there exists uh, a subset of polynomials, Um, if there exists such a subset in the polynomial functions, such that for every function in I, for every function in this set, uh, we, look at, we look at where this function is identically zero. Uh, if for all elements of I, the, the points that those functions are zero is equal to A, then A is called closed. Uh, does it make sense? Uh, yes, it, it does. Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I can give an example. Like I, I, I don't know how detailed I, I should, I should go. But uh, I guess I mean as much as much detail as you can give. Okay. So, uh, so um. I wanted to get a blank page and then maybe write something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, is there an option like that? I forgot. Oh, to get a blank. Uh, do you have a blank pages like slide inserted, or you can go back and and up, uh, upload one? I see. So never mind that. Okay. So just to, just to give you an example, let's look at this one. So I, I'm going to write the example here. Okay. So let's say V is uh, complex numbers C, C two. Okay. So this is my uh, vector space V, and then uh, let's say my subset is let's say A is equal to uh, the X axis. Okay, so X axis. So it is just so. So if, if I define, if I look at this particular subset of C two, I claim that this is a closed subset uh, because I can choose I to be just the following uh, subset. Right, this is uh, this subset, y is a polynomial function on C2. If you look at where it is, where it becomes zero, it is zero on the x-axis. So x-axis is a closed set, okay. So once I define my subsets this, in this manner, uh, I get a topology. Okay, so um, let me move on. So this topology is called uh, the Zelisky topology. Okay, uh, so if, if X is the subset V, then I of X denotes the set of all polynomial functions that vanish on X. You can just check this. It, it is an ideal. In other words, uh, if you take uh, an arbitrary polynomial function, and if you take an element of this set I of X, multiply them together, uh, the resulting function will still be inside I. So I of X will be an ideal for any subset X. Okay, and uh, so I define um, the the uh, ring of polynomial functions on this subset X to be the quotient of this ring K of V modulo this ideal. 
Okay, so this is my coordinate function. So, so you you should think of this set, this this caution ring, element of this caution ring, uh, are uh, polynomials such that these polynomials are not zero, are not zero on X. So uh, they are zero if and only if uh, they they fall into this ideal. As long as you are away from this ideal, you get a polynomial function on X. Right? So I, idea is simple. We would like to study the set X together with the function them, polynomial function. And those polynomial functions are defined on this quotient set. Okay, so sometimes this quotient set is called coordinate ring or um, ring of polynomial functions and so on. So there are some algebraic properties of these quotients. For instance, if x is an irreducible algebraic variety, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going ahead of my um, stuff. So uh, maybe you've seen this concept, uh, irreducible subset. So um, um, so we are going to call this subset irreducible if the associated ideal i of x is a prime ideal. And so if the i of x of the set x is a prime ideal, then x is called irreducible set. And um, uh, if this irreducible, if this set x uh, is a closed set to the resulting subset x is called an affine algebraic variety. So an affine algebraic variety x is a closed subset of the vector space whose ideal of vanishing polynomials this is i of x, is a prime ideal. Um, uh, so uh, does it mean that once you define the, uh, the Zersky topology, right, it means that uh, since the your basic sets are the closed sets, that means that basically you have that your your basic your basic sets are, are, are even varieties, right? Uh, so the basic sets are, um, so you know, we can define topology either by producing open sets yeah. Or alternatively giving the closed sets, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm declaring a, a set to be closed if uh, it comes from a bunch of polynomials. Yeah. Uh, that, and those polynomials vanish on that set. Yeah. So my closed subsets in this topology are precisely those sets that are zeros of polynomials. Yeah. I don't care how many polynomials I use for the time yeah. being. Mm -hmm. I have a set of polynomials. Yeah. Uh, and I look at the zeros of this polynomial. That yeah. the common zero set is my yeah. closed. Okay. Know, this is the basis, basis for my topology. Okay. Okay. And if it turns out that this corresponding ideal is prime, prime ideal. Yeah then I call this set irreducible. Okay. Okay, so, and, and just to make a definition, an affine algebraic variety is a closed irreducible subset. That's it. Simple. So, an affine algebraic variety is a closed set which is irreducible. Okay. Okay, so let me, uh, any, any, anything, any questions so far? Um, I think you don't have any questions to ask, so I guess here yeah, we can move on. Um, uh, should I move on, you said? Yeah, 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 you, you can. You don't have any questions to ask, so, yeah. Yes, that's good. So um, now, okay. So now the uh, the projective variety. So we introduced a fine variety. Now projective variety. Um, so first, let's start with the most basic case. 
if I, we just look at the vector space V, its projectivization uh, is by definition uh, is the set of uh, is the set of lines. So what we do is take V and take a line passing through the origin and treat this as if it's a single point. Okay. So when I write P of V, uh, I actually consider only the set of lines through the origin. And I call this projectivization of V. Uh, this is a, a kind of counterintuitive at the first sight, but uh, um, I mean, that's basically uh, the object that you study when you would like to uh, look at infinity, because when you identify lines, as a, when you treat lines as a single point, what you're doing is that you're treating infinity, the points at infinity, in your space too. So line goes to the infinity. It, it gives you some um, intuition about infinity as well. And the nice thing is that the projectivization of vector space is a is a closed sort of it's a compact object. Okay, so uh, I'm going to define algebraic variety in the projectivization. So X, a subset of the projectivization, will be called closed if there are um, homogeneous polynomials on V such that uh, when you um, evaluate these polynomials on the set of points of X, you get zero again. Um, is it, does it make sense, this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but by, by the way, uh, homogeneous means the, the polynomial has all of its monomials of the same degree. Okay, so, so okay, so how, how, how are the, the algebraic or closed sets in the projectivization related to closed sets in the non-projectivization? Uh, here's a picture that, that actually explains this connection. So uh, if you start with the vector space V, then you pass the projectivization, you basically uh, it has smaller space in some sense because you are identifying each line with a point. So if I take this line in X, right, I mean, and let me write it. So if Y is a closet in P of V, uh, for every point on Y, let's say, let's say I take this point here. One second. Let's say I take this point, and it's over here. Uh, this point, uh, by definition of projectivization, uh, a line identified with a point in TV, right? So this whole line passing through that point corresponds to this point projectivization. In other words, uh, if you take a closed subset of the projective space, it is equivalent to taking a cone in the vector space V. So this is a cone, right? You, you take the object Y, and then you just connect every point by a line to the origin and just continue. And the resulting geometric object is called a cone over Y, but essentially it is nothing but uh, Y, this close, uh, this set Y, viewed in V. So these are identical. They give you same data. One of them is in the projective space. The other one is in the affine space. So V is sometimes called affine space. Okay, so, so we can go back and forth between projective subsets, I mean the closed subsets in the projective space and closed subsets in the affine space. Okay. Um, now, um, so what I need next is uh, the notion of a morphism between algebraic varieties. Um, so let's say 
W is another affine space. So it's just like V. And I take, take another closed subset V. So there is an ideal of polynomials on W whose zero set is Z. Uh, then I'm going to call a function F from one closed subset that lives in V to the closed subset Z. Uh, a regular function or a polynomial function or a morphism if there exists uh, a polynomial, honest polynomial function from this vector space V to W. So I think the correct way of viewing this is that uh, or let's say W is M dimensional. Then I write a, a map capital F N dimensional to M dimensional vector space. Each coordinate has a is a polynomial itself. Uh, so this V has let's say N coordinates, and coordinates are x1 up to x n. The image is going to have M coordinates. Each coordinate is going to be given by a function of the N N variables on V. So if we have such a map capital F, it's just a polynomial function on the coordinates. And if, when I restrict it to X, it agrees with this little f, then I'm going to call this F uh, a regular morphism uh, or regular function or a polynomial function. Uh, common, all of them are the same, same name. I mean, in some textbooks, they call it regular functions or just morphisms and so on. Okay. And so the notion of isomorphism is is just as you guess. The, it has to be invertible, and it has restricted polynomial functions in the opposite direction as well. And we call it biregular or isomorphism. Okay. And same thing for the projective space, right? If you have a subset in the projective space of V, and then another one in the projective space of W. Uh, we call that it's a morphism if there is a capital F from PV to PW, it's a polynomial function and this tricks to little bit. Uh, then it is called a morphism. Another way of saying this is that take the cones over these varieties Y, cone over this variety V, and then check whether there is a regular map in the affine spaces or not. If it, if it does, then it's a morphism. So what, what we have so far is the uh, definition of algebraic varieties, the definition of Zariski topology, and then we introduce definition of uh, we introduce the notion of projective space, and then we introduce the notion of amorphism. Okay, so no, we haven't done much yet. Next, uh, we move to linear algebraic groups. Okay, so what's a linear algebraic group? Uh, uh, essentially, it's a closed subset of uh, general linear of invertible linear maps on V. So GR, by, by GRV, I, I, I mean set up all linear uh, isomorphisms from V to V. Right, this is GLV by their definition, vertical linear isomorphisms from V to V. Okay, so it's a group. We all know this because if you take two invertible uh, linear transformations, if they are invertible, their composition is also invertible. So it is a group. Uh, well, the first thing that I would like to tell you is that this group is actually um, algebraic variety in the sense that we just saw. Uh, to see this, uh, let's look at the determinant function. So the determinant function uh, takes a linear transformation on V and gives us its determinant, right? And another way to describe this GLV is to view it as a set of all functions whose determinant non-zero. Okay, but we, uh, the, 
so what do we have? We have this home space of all uh, linear maps from V to V. We know that this is a, uh, this is a vector space itself. And, and then we have a polynomial function, which is determinant. And GRV is defined as the non-vanishing of the polynomial function. But if you remember, we find our clause set as the vanishing focus of polynomials. So with respect to this definition, GRV is an open subset of this space. So it's a group and it's an open set in a suitable affine space. Uh, suitable affine space being this one. Okay. Uh, so, uh, if you would like to work, think a little bit more on this one. Uh, it's, a, it's a fun exercise. It's not so difficult. Uh, can you uh, show that uh, this GRV is actually, um, okay, it's open in the first component, but if you multiply it by K, another copy of field, now you can show that it's a closed subset here in the in the Zariski, Zariski topology. Okay, so. And uh, we had the, we had the definition of uh, regular polynomial functions on GRV, so you can just compute it for fun. And it's not so difficult. You learn a lot doing this. Uh, let's, let's move on. Okay. So by a linear algebraic group, which I mean a subgroup of GRV, which is a closed set. Okay, so a subgroup of GRV is called linear algebraic group. If it's a group plus, it's a closed subset of GRV in the Zariski topology. Okay. So linear algebraic groups are closed subgroups of ARV by definition. Now, uh, let's move to this important notion, algebraic torus. And, uh, a torus is, uh, by definition, an algebraic torus is, is a closed subgroup, ARV, uh, that consists of uh, semi-simple or diagonalizable elements. Remember from linear algebra, if you work over algebraically closed field, uh, we can always use for the characteristic polynomial, so we can always compute eigenvalues. Uh, if it happens that the, the set of generalized eigenvectors spans the underlying vector space V, uh, then our linear transformation is invertible, uh, is diagonalizable. This is one of the basic results that we learn in linear algebra. Uh, when a matrix is diagonalizable over complex numbers, right? This is the basic question. It's diagonalizable if and only if um, you can find a basis for the vector space consisting of eigenvectors of linear transformation. So all diagonalizable matrices, uh, sorry, uh, any closed group which consists of diagonalizable pieces is called an algebraic torus. Again, an algebraic torus is a closed subgroup of GRV whose elements are diagonalizable. All right. <laughs> So, in this case, I mean, um, we know that for matrix groups, usually when we talk about toruses and matrix groups, we say a matrix is uh, a torus uh, is something which is isomorphic to some, uh, uh, to a product of copies of S1, right? So, in this case, uh, is there something similar for an algebraic torus? So, that in the case where it's, it's finite, it's a finite dimensional vector space. 
Okay, so uh, uh, let me explain this uh, S1 connection. Uh, in this algebraic setting, uh, what I am seeing is that uh, a torus uh, consists of diagonalizable elements. And but if it is diagonalizing, it means that there is a conjugation matrix that takes this yeah. element to the diagonal matrix. Yeah. yeah. In other words, you can view elements of your torus as diagonal matrices. Yeah. But of course, it has to be invertible. So these are mm -hmm. non zero complex numbers on the diagonal. So okay. Every diagonal entry is a copy of C star. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, by C star, I mean complex numbers throw away the zero. Yeah, yeah. Then you ask, what is C star topologically? So it is the complex mm -hmm. plane except the origin missing. Now, yeah. topologically, this is circle. You can just, you know, take the origin and then enlarge it and then contact yeah. the, the other boundaries. So it's, it's equivalent to a circle topologically. Yeah, yeah. And that's why an algebraic torus is topologically product of a bunch of circles. Yeah, okay. This is the topology of the uh, yeah. algebraic torus. Okay. Now, um, so I, I would like to get a little bit deeper. Um, so let's go to um, uh, this is not going to be too too deep representation theory, but I will tell you the basics of representation theory. So um, let's say G is an algebraic group, linear algebraic group. So it lives as a closed subgroup of G and B. But because it's a subgroup of G and B, its elements are endomorph uh, invertible transformations on B. So each element of G is a map from V to V, invertible. Uh, so, uh, in other words, G, uh, this vector space V, uh, is a vector space on which G acts. This, uh, sometimes these, these objects are, are called G modules, G modules, right? Um, uh, so, well, we have this algebraic group T, um, and we can look at the uh, diagonalizable elements in G. So let's say T is such a group. So let's say T is an algebraic group. Uh, so, um, of course, T acts on V by diagonalizable matrices. Um, so, um, if I look at the coordinate ring of this uh, variety, because t is, t, when you say algebraic torus, you assume that it's a closed set, so you can talk about coordinate ring. So these are all polynomial functions on t. Uh, and if you view t as diagonal matrices, just a bunch of copies of c star, you're looking at the uh, functions on some copies of c star. I'm going to choose a special uh, subset of these uh, functions on the uh, finite copies of star uh, C. So I'm going to call a, a polynomial function on T a, a, a wait a second. So it, I didn't write what I was trying to say here. Uh, so a, a regular function on T from t to k star is called a character of the torus t. If it is a, if it first of all lives in here in this ring, second, if it is a homomorphism. So character of an algebraic torus is just a polynomial function on t with non-zero values, and it's a group homomorphism. Okay, so these are my characters. They play a fundamental role for the representation theory of G. Let's uh, move to the next page. Um, so I, look, I call this collection of all characters on T is the, is the character group. What happens is the following. Um, because I have a bunch of uh, diagonalizable matrices, so T consists of diagonalizable elements. So um, if I 
so because because T consists of diagonal diagonalizable elements, I can ask for this natural question of any uh, joint eigenspaces of these elements of T. So um, I would like to determine subsets of T uh, such that that subset is a is a simultaneous eigenspace for all elements of T. Okay. Uh, turns out this subset is canonically attached to these characters. So for every character chi, uh, there is uh, a joint eigenspace. I'm, I'm denoting by v chi. By definition, it consists of all vectors v such that for all elements of the torus T, uh, the following happens. T, when applied to v, I know that it's diagonalizable. So uh, it will produce me some eigenvector. And I want this eigenvector to be the precisely the value of the character. Okay. So if this happens for all t in the torus, then I, I look at this collection. So this collection is a vector subspace. And I, I denote this vector subspace by v chi. This is the joint eigenspace with eigenfunction chi. So whenever uh, this joint eigenspace is non-zero, this character chi is called the weight. And, um, and v chi is called the uh, chi weight of the space. So now, um, if I denote all characters that gives me a non-zero eigenspace, uh, and I can decompose my vector space as a direct sum of the eigenspaces. Of course, this is basic linear algebra. If you have fine, you know, if you have a bunch of uh, endomorphisms of a vector space V, remember there is this simultaneous diagonalizability theorem in linear algebra. It is nothing but this theorem. I mean, this is you simultaneously diagonalize your vector space because of your commuting. Uh, commuting uh, linear transformation. So it decomposes this way. OK. Now, uh, I'm still missing. Now, now th these are the beginnings of the toric, uh, toric variety. Okay. So um, now, um, if we take all these uh, non-zero characters, or the weights of our torus T, and the ring of regular functions is precisely the polynomial ring in these characters plus the polynomials in the, the inverses of these functions. So this is just like Laurent polynomial. So let's say we have chi1 up to chi m. Then we add 1 over chi1 up to 1 over chi m. And look at the ring that they generate. This is the ring of Laurent polynomials. Now if we have this coordinate ring, then of course, um, this is simple exercise. You can just verify that the, the, the associated algebraic variety has to be just case a bunch of uh, copies of uh, non-zero elements of the field. Okay. And then um, what else? The uh, the character group chi t. Remember, this is all set of all characters of t. Uh, you can check that any element of this uh, is a monomial in this uh, characters chi1 up to chi m. Um, so what we see here is that the uh, character group on a torus T can be identified with the um, uh, the lattice, m-dimensional lattice. It's just these are integers. You just take n copies of integers. Um, so character character group on an algebraic torus is a lattice. It is just like z cross z cross z cross z cross. So any questions so far? Any? <laughs> I think it's all right. If you have any questions, we'll ask. I think yeah, we can move on. Okay. So okay. Now next, 
we have a group G. Uh, we can look at all homomorphisms from K star to G. We call these such homomorphisms uh, one parameter subgroups of the group G. Okay, so given a vector space V, we, we, we take a, a linear algebraic subgroup G and all homomorphisms from underlying field, non zero elements of the field to the group G is called one parameter subgroup. You can easily check the collection of all one parameter subgroups is a Z module. So Z, the, the integers acts on these functions. You just raise it to the nth power. That's it. Uh, the, the reason I want to tell you is because these uh, one parameter subgroups are in some sense dual objects to the characters. What do I mean by this? Is the following. Um, if you take the character group, and if you take the one parameter subgroup, there's a non degenerate pairing between them. So if chi is a character, lambda is a one parameter subgroup. Uh, when you compose them, remember chi goes from k star to the group G. Uh, and then, uh, sorry, lambda goes from k star to G, and then chi goes from uh, G to k, k star. So their composition is a map from k star to k star. Then you ask, what are the polynomial functions from k star to k star? There are not many of them. Actually, there is, uh, it's only power function. So if you, if you look at a regular homomorphism from k star to k star, it has to raise the element to the nth power. It's, it's a basic exercise. You can verify this. Uh, so any such composition has to be of this form to the m. Okay. So we, we define the pairing between chi and lambda to be this integer m. And you can check this is a non-degenerate uh, bilinear pairing between a character group and the one parameter uh, What does this tell us? Because these are uh, dual to each other with respect to this pairing, uh, we had a lattice x of t. So we, we obtain the dual lattice, y of t. So uh, one parameter groups, one parameter subgroups form a dual lattice. Okay. So what we have so far is that uh, we have the one parameter subgroups and we have vector groups. We know that character group is the lattice, it's z to the m or some m, and the uh, one parameter subgroup form a lattice due to the uh, other lattice. Okay, so let's move on. Oh, is this the end? Okay, so why did I tell you these one parameter groups and so on? Because of the following. Um, now, um, okay, so um, I mean, I guess we could go from here to several different uh, directions. Um, one direction that we can talk about um, the, is um, the torus section. Now, now that we have algebraic defined the algebraic torus. We can consider the, um, the the actions of k star on G, or uh, more generally on certain quotients of G. So, uh, for some reason, I, I don't have the rest of my slide. Uh, but let me uh, 
okay, so so now we have an algebraic group G, right? I'm going to define subgroup G B. Uh, so I'll 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 take a subgroup B. Uh, I'm going to call the subgroup Boran. Uh, uh, if this is called Borasapu, if, uh, if it is maximal, close connected solvable subgroup. So it is a maximal. Uh, a lot of adjectives, maximal um, um, clause and summable. So I, I need all these conditions. So a Borasa group is by definition a closed, solvable, maximal subgroup. So why, why, why do I say this? Because they play an important role for the structure theorems or the algebraic groups, solvable group. So let me remind you what solvable means. So uh, solvable means that uh, there exists a nested sequence of subgroups uh, that are finite many subgroups nested, so they lie within each other, and each of each successive nest is a normal subgroup. So we have a sequence of normal subgroups starting from the identity group, trivial subgroup, to the B. Okay? And then successive terms are normal in each other, so we can take their quotients. If each of these quotients are commutative, then the group is called solvable. So a group is called solvable if and only if there exists a nested sequence of normal sub such that successive portions are committed. Now, uh, examples of these groups, uh, first of all, any uh, there, there is a famous theorem of uh, Fate and Thompson from 1963, which says that um, any finite group of odd order is solvable. This, uh, this theorem was considered one of the uh, most difficult uh, theorems uh, in history up to 1963. So there's a very fundamental result in group theory. You can easily check abelian groups are solvable because it just follows from definition. But the, for algebraic groups, for linear algebraic groups, the important solvable groups are algebraic torus. Toruses are all solvable because they are commutative. And next, uh, the upper triangular matrices. You can check, uh, verify. You can produce successive sequence of normal subgroups of group of upper triangular matrices such that each quotient is commutative. So upper triangular matrix, inverted upper triangular matrices is solvable. So in fact, it's a chronicle example of a Borel subgroup. When I say Borel subgroup, uh, the first uh, image should be up, upper triangular matrices in your mind. Okay, so now, now uh, but you see, I never said this solvable subgroup is normal. So if I look at the coset space, G mod B, this will not be a group in general, unless B is normal in G. But upper triangular matrices is not normal in a GLD. Okay, so this is, this is a problem. But I'm interested in this quotient set, G mod B. Okay, so G mod B is is a quotient space, but it is not a group because B is not necessarily the normal. B is not normal in G, but it is solvable. So let me write it. This is not a group. However, it's a topological space because G is a topological space. 
B is a topological space, uh, we can talk about the coset space. Uh, this is not a group. Okay, so you may ask what kind of uh, space is this quotient space? Uh, it is uh, actually um, um, I'm pretty sure you have seen this before, uh, maybe not in this context, but this is called the flag variety. Okay, so this is The reason it is called flag variety is because uh, you can identify its elements by successive uh, vectors, uh, con con successive vector spaces, vector subspaces. Uh, uh, Okay, so the flag variety is, you can, it's a fundamental result in algebraic group theory. It's a, diff, if you work over complex numbers, it's a differentiable manifold. Uh, it's a complex, uh, sorry, it's a complex analytical manifold. Uh, its dimension is n choose two if you are, if, if G is GLN. Um, and uh, the, the point is the following, the, the, the torus T is a subgroup of B. So algebraic torus is a subgroup of Borel subgroup because if you think of upper triangle matrices, it contains the diagonal matrices. So there is a torus contained in B. Uh, so when I mod out on the right, I kill a bunch of uh, elements from G that, that stays on the right hand side of the group. But on the left hand side, I can multiply by the torus elements, right? Now, uh, so using one parameter group, I define uh, a multiplication on this coset space. And it turns out this, uh, this multiplication, the, well, these are the missing uh, pages in my slides. The, if you look at the fixed sublocus of this multiplication, uh, it turns out the, the matrices which represents the fixed points of the flag variety are precisely permutation matrices. So uh, you can bring the symmetric group into this coset space as a bunch of points that come from uh, the fixed locus of a, a torus action. Um, I think um, if you don't have any questions, I'd like to stop here. We can, uh, it has been uh, one hour and it's getting a little bit more technical. I don't know how much I should go. Um, I do you have any questions? Uh, you have any questions? Do you have any questions for him or? Yeah, we can go. Hello? Uh, yeah, yeah. Hello? Yes, okay. yes, I do hear you. Do you have any questions? No, we don't have any questions. Okay. 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 I, I, I hope that was really helpful. It, it got technical towards the end, but... Um, uh, the main thing is that there is a beautiful um, interplay between uh, these linear algebraic groups, torus actions, and the fixed points of the torus actions, uh, which brings combinatorial uh, studies into the study of structured results of the uh, linear algebraic groups. But, uh, but that, that is getting slightly more advanced. Uh, I had to a lot uh, talk a lot more to explain this. Yeah, okay.
Yeah, so hopefully, probably your uh, second lecture, you could uh, you could you could elaborate on this since uh, this covered the, the fundamentals and the basics. So, and since this is being recorded, I mean, they would have something to 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 go back at the, to and and refer to. So, that that works then. That works. Yeah. Um, so, any any more questions or, or concerns from the University of Ghana? You're okay. Okay. Okay then. Okay then. Yeah, uh, Thank you very much, and then we'll uh, talk soon then. Okay. Greetings from here to Ghana. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. That. Hello. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hi, Janet, do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I hear you.